last week we did an extensive review here. And we're not going to do an extensive one tonight, but I'm going to hit some main points of the last few weeks here again. We've had so many in and out that uh, some have heard some points, some have heard none, some have heard one over here. But 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30 is our keynote scripture for this entire series. And we're going to read the last part of the verse. Them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And we have learned, thank you, Lord, for this offering. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. We have learned that if we honor a leader, we'll receive the reward God has to give through that leader. For instance, if we pull on the prophet's anointing, what will we get? Prophet. If we say, I don't think I even believe in that prophet stuff. Let's just, I'll get some good teaching. What are we going to get? Good teaching. Tell me this. We haven't talked about this much. Uh, you've heard me mention it in the past, but not in this series, I don't think. But if you just call me good old Debbie and pull on Debbie's anointing, what's there going to be a good chance you're going to get? Good old Debbie. Good old Debbie. <laughs> and good old Debbie doesn't have much to give. But if you pull on the pastoral anointing, what should you get? The pastoral anointing. It's not about let's make Pastor Debbie feel good and call her Pastor Debbie. It's about if people learn to respect that. And one time in my husband's church um, before, I don't even, I can't even remember if I was married to him or her as an evangelist. There have been so many different times. But I mentioned that to somebody. Um, oh, I think I mentioned it from the pulpit that he should be called Pastor Bob. And somebody was going to challenge me with that the way people always are. And not even just letting it go, but they walked right up when I was standing there and he was standing there and saying, hey, Bob, what? You could tell they were making a point of it. And I thought, and you'll get only what Bob has to give. It's not a matter of, oh, this elevated person, worship them, make sure you call them pastor. What? No, it's about honoring. And you're going to see as we get into this, a lot more scriptures on honor. Now, that doesn't mean if they went out fishing, with Bob, that they could call him Bob. Although even one-on-one -on -one doing fun things with Pastor, with Pastor Rodney, whether it's a birthday party or what, that, that got very awkward. I, I couldn't have ever called him, hey, Rodney, pass the cake, please. But, uh, but um, you know, I don't have a problem with that if people are just talking to somebody, they don't even think about it, they're used to calling him something. But if I'm pulling on the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I'm going, God, I don't see them as my pal, my relative, the lady who married my old pastor, whatever. I see them as the pastor, and I need to be guided, and I need to be brought up higher. And, Lord, I'm going to pull on that anointing. We talked about that uh, there are differences between the degree of of the anointing in different places in the world as we discussed Hill Osborne and John Bevere and all of those stories. And it came down to one word, respect, and how they were treated wherever they went and where they were treated in honor. They had the greatest impact, the greatest miracles. It was the easiest to preach in, the strongest presence of God. Um, and they said they noticed it in developing countries, prisons, military bases, because they show honor and realize authority. We talked about Hannah with Eli. If you ask me, Eli didn't deserve much respect. What do you think? The way he talked to her. She could have told him off and her flesh could have easily done that. But because of his place and God had not yet removed him, he had already told him, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge your house. Da, da, da. But he didn't take him out yet. That day's coming. Judgment's coming your way. But right now, he's still standing in that place. So she said, yes, my Lord, but it's not what you think. I'm not drunk. I'm petitioning. And she got a son out of it, got a mighty son out of it. She would not even have got that son from the Lord had she not honored the man of God. We talked about the importance of authority. Um, it means to treat them with deference and submission and perform relative duties to. We talked about it. It involves submission and authority. We talked about, remember back with the Roman officer. He was a man who recognized and acknowledged authority, so he greatly honored Jesus, and he received what kind of a reward? Partial, none, or full? He received a full reward. 
And we don't have much regard for kingdom delegated authority anymore, especially in a democracy. But we said there's four divisions of authority, civil, church, family, and social, employers, teachers, coaches, all of those things are included. The kingdom of God is a kingdom. It has rank, order, and delegated authority. We said all authority is from God and given from our protection, our provision, and our peace. And a lot of people run to home churches. We talked about that because they don't want any authority. They don't want to have to give an account to anyone. I want to do my own thing. And there's no head honcho. We're all equally whatever they are. And that's not even biblical. Um, Jesus is the one who established authority. True New Testament government and accountability is in the Bible. Paul told Titus and Timothy to set up elders, to correct, to rebuke, to exhort, and build up the churches. We said he who has no honor in his heart for authority is not even saved. You know, there, it's one thing for somebody to come in off the street and have no, not been taught anything at home and not been taught anything anywhere about authority. But if they truly know Jesus, they can't stay that way very long I'm going, I don't care what you say, I'll do whatever I want. And you won't tell me what to do. And I don't have to give and I don't believe in that tithing stuff. And I don't think I have to be faithful. And, and I don't think I got to stay for the whole service. And I don't think, well, they're just, I don't even know what they're there for. Because if they have no respect for authority at all, they can't even be saved because God puts that in the hearts of people who belong to him. God and his authority are inseparable. Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. It doesn't say authorities are elected. It doesn't say they're selected by the people. God himself appoints them. And appointed in the Greek means to assign, to ordain, or to set in place. We have talked about how we show honor practically, and we're going to get into a lot more of that tonight, some interesting things. But we said, first of all, reference, how we refer to someone, and I was just talking about that a moment ago. You do it with dignity and respect. It shows you honor him. How would you rather be addressed, my good friend or that guy over there? That old man sitting there, he's a guy who taught me something. Or that's my mentor, that's my elder, that's... You hear me probably go overboard more than most pastors do when I'm introducing someone that I truly do respect and truly do honor because I so much believe in that. And some people may think we go overboard, but so many other people go underboard that I'm going to make up for it. Um, there was somebody, I'm not going to get very detailed here. I'm going to chalk it up to being young and inexperienced, although both people I think should know better for lots of reasons. But there was somebody that, I just noticed this is really odd for them to not even make reference for the pastor or room for the pastor to even say anything or I start to sit up. And, the, and, um, and I know after service one night, and we've had a lot of people in here, so don't try to figure out who it is. But in, in a course of conversation, um, I, don't, I don't even remember what my husband said, how it came up. They said something and he said something. And um, oh, if, if, if you honor this person talking about me, you should at least address them or at least give them an open place. And, and one of the two said, well, I guess we haven't learned how to butter the bread of the pastors where we go yet. Yeah. Oh. I thought, I'm going to let that go, oh. not make a, a, a comment on it. But I thought, there's an area to need to go back to school here. Uh, nobody even had, we were taught that greatly in Bible school, every Bible school I was in. But I've said so many times, if I wouldn't have been taught that, somehow I knew that. Is that common sense? Is that because I came from a family who really taught respect and you don't speak up and you don't speak out of order and you don't, you know, you maybe, maybe all those things added to it. I don't know. But I just find myself in the ministry anymore thinking, how can people have such a lack of common sense and courteous respect? And um, I'm not trying to just pat people's backs so they'll pat mine. Richard and I are very, very good friends, always have been. But I, I wasn't thinking, okay, this is my pal. I'll make him look really good in front of my people. First, I didn't have to. His ministry speaks for itself. But secondly, the more even this week I was under it, you heard me. I meant every word of that. I told him privately what I told you publicly, the growth I have seen and the depth and the maturity. And, the, and um, you want your people to pull on that. 
I, I wanted, I thought, I hope the place comes unglued a thousand times more than it does for me. I need my people free and I need my people, come on. But the more I can introduce, truthfully introduce, this is a powerful man of God. Pull on the anointing tonight. Expect to get something. Um, if you want to do something, go ahead, bro. That, that's, that's, that's lack of respect and honor in the house. And so we said you don't, um, you shouldn't refer to people just on the basis of nationality or color, but you, neither should you have the prejudice of rich against poor, poor against the rich, denominations against each other, the educated against the uneducated. We need to learn how to refer to one another right and show respect and dignity. When talking about the president, not good to say that jerk. Uh, and uh, even though we all catch ourselves these days doing that, uh, maybe they did some ungodly stuff, but got to honor the place. Wouldn't be good to just say, what if you had an appointment with him? Even as much as I dislike everything he does, everything, I think. If I had an appointment with him, there is no way I would get, go up to his desk and say, hey, Prez, you know, we think you're a jerk, but I'm going to talk to you. I'm good enough to talk to you about something. I would walk in and say, thank you so much, Mr. President, for taking the time to talk with me and honor that place that he stands in. Um, there are people who, especially little kids in this generation anymore, calling their parents by their first name, parents by their first name, no respect, need to make some adjustments in those areas and change in these, these things, even how we address God. Yes, we need to be comfortable when coming into the presence of the Lord. He is Abba, Daddy, Father. But some people get so casual in their approach that they're not even respectful. Hey, you know, you know me anyway. You know the stuff I just did. And, you know, you're my good old daddy. I'm just going to get up there and give you some sloppy old kisses. No, you can be comfortable and come boldly into the throne room with still your holy and I'm so thankful that you want to talk with me and that you allow me to talk with you. Reverential. Some talk about the Holy Spirit like you got the ghost. And we say well, you can be free with him, but realize who you're talking to when you come to prayer. Um, I talked a lot about those things last week. And people say, well, I'm not going to talk like that. They're just a man or they're just a woman like I am. Oh, <laughs> what a revelation. Everybody is human. Every leader, every preacher, everybody, just a man or a woman after the flesh. However, if God has given them a place, that place is more than flesh. Sure, you know them after the flesh. If you get, that's one advantage a pastor has of a large church. 99% of that congregation never eats with them, never is in their home, never rides in a car with them, never even talks to them. Some of them don't even stand at the door and shake hands. I'm not saying if they should or they shouldn't, but they only see them up there. And many times they see them coming in after a gigantic crusade and the film's going of the, oh, the bigger than life person. That's why I'm going to be able to go into my friend's church here in a couple weeks. And even though I may have a church the same size, it's not like, oh, let's bring Pastor Debbie in who's, who's so successful in pastoring here. But the fact that I won't be her voice will cause everybody to go, oh, yay. Where if I say the same things that Pastor LaShawn says, she can say it and it'll be, how dare you. And if I say it, it'll be, oh. We all clapped and smiled and laughed when Richard said, it's time to pay the price. It's time to come up higher. I'm on a quest. We cannot do all these things. That's right. Yay. But let a pastor who knows the people start getting practical in the ways that's walked out, how you do come up higher, how you do press it. And then it's, hmm, it's the different voice because that person, you don't know them after the flesh. And that's how somehow we've got to learn to manage that anyway. Yes, they put on their pants one leg at a time. And you know, they got weaknesses and make mistakes. But if you don't honor their place, you don't honor the God who put them in that place. Though we're all equally loved and have equal share in redemption, we don't have equal place in the kingdom or in the church. And if you don't believe that, how will you show honor to anyone's position? We're going to talk about that today a little bit more. Remember we said that Saul was acting like a jerk, amen? I'd say it's worse than a jerk trying to murder David. 
and yet David called him the Lord's anointed. That'd be kind of hard. That'd be kind of hard. Somebody's trying to kill you. Hello, the Lord's anointed. Uh, one of the most serious charges you can do in the New Testament, we said, is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. What is that? Well, when Jesus was doing works by the Holy Spirit and they attribute it to works of the devil, he said that was blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's as dishonoring and disrespectful as you can get to call the work of God the work of the devil. But do you know people come very close to that today? A real move of God, but they didn't like something or something offended them or they thought it was too fleshly and I think that's terrible and I don't think we should have. That's getting too close for comfort. Now, when we got into some of those things, I also talked about people going the other way, though, like toting the Holy Ghost. And they think, you know, we went into all that last week that unfortunately we, we uh, did not get on live stream, but we have it all recorded, right, Brother Bob? So as we get that up there on YouTube, I want people to hear those stories. That I, I'm not going to go back over it tonight, but those of you who are here or heard it, um, people can get way too loose. We must respect the Holy Spirit and his blood, the blood of Jesus. How you speak of the blood is so important. Now, not only referring to people is how we act out honor, but how we prefer people. Romans 12.10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. The number one way to show respect and honor is how you refer. The second way is how you prefer. Everybody say preference. We talked about reference. Now we're talking about preference. We're all loved the same. We have the same rights. We have the same promises. We have the same gifts of the spirit. Oh, but we do not have the same place or rank in the kingdom of God or the body of Christ. Again, there's authority, structure, and rank. Is everybody going to be rewarded the same? We asked that before, but I'm asking it again. No. Does everybody love God to the same degree? The interesting thing is if you asked every Christian, I bet they think they love God to the same degree, but they don't. Does everybody live the same? No. Does everybody commit the same? No. Does everybody obey the same? No. And not everybody has the same place. Not everybody's going to get the same reward. We said if you're a good parent or a good employee, uh, employer, and I'm going to take it a step further as we talked about, or a good pastor, you cannot play favorites, but neither can you excuse things and pass out the same rewards for all behavior. Um, Matthew 10, 40 says, he that receives you receives me. He that receives me receives him that sent me. God's really big on delegation. If the Lord sends someone to the church as a guest minister, and we have one coming up in February, by the way, I was going to announce this. I saw on Facebook a couple of days ago that Brother Kelly was, was in Texas right now. He's getting ready to leave there. But he had a big front page newspaper ad on Facebook. People were flying in from all over the world and healings occurring and everything. That's the young man who's coming here in a few weeks. God is really exploding that young man's ministry. So how should we receive them? Just like we're receiving the Lord because he takes it that way personally. We should receive each other in honor as sent by the Lord. Uh, one indication of maturity is being able to see the gifting in people and the anointings on people instead of just their flesh. We're going to learn to respect the things of God. Some people think respect means scared stiff. No, but neither is it getting so light that we're disrespectful. We're going to learn when to be quiet, when to yield. And the more we learn this, the more the gifts of manifestations will increase. You know, I came close to doing something tonight, but by the time I got the idea, I thought, no, we'd have to work on it. And <laughs> but I did this one time in Bible school. I asked Pastor Rodney and Adonica if I could teach a class nobody had ever taught that I knew of. I said, let's call it ministry etiquettes <laughs> or ministry etiquette, I think I called it. And so I'm teaching the students ways to act and not to act in the ministry or in other people's churches or in your own church. And I staged this ahead of time where as I was teaching, I have one of the students stand up and act like they're given a message in tongues. And, and I, I, this was all planned. I, I said, I need you to hold that. I'm not finished teaching. I won't hold it. God's giving it to me right now. And I said, I'm going to ask you to teach. I won't, I won't because I got to obey God. And then I said, ushers, carry them out. And uh, you saw all the rest of the students go, 
like, what just caused that student to flip out? And everybody's staring at the floor. I go on teaching for a while, and then somebody else speaks out and says, I don't agree with that. And I said, well, wait, we're, we're going to talk about that after class, but you don't have a right to say that now while I'm speaking. I do, too. I'm a Christian, too. And I want and, I, you know, so after three times, I had the ushers carry him out. I'm telling you, by the end of that class, here's how the students were sitting. They were just like, oh, oh they're all praying in tongues. And uh, when I announced to them, sorry, students, I was trying to show you what actually has happened in my meetings, not all on the same night, but what's happened in other people's meetings that I've been in, and showing you how disruptive that is to a meeting. And they all went, oh, we all thought everybody flipped out tonight. <laughs> and, but the truth of the matter is these crazy things happen. And uh, the more we learn how to act, uh, the more the gifts and manifestations will increase. We, we don't have any delusion about the flesh, man or woman. I don't care who they are. They have their faults. They make mistakes. But if God has chosen them, put his anointing on them and uses them, he wants to recognize them and he wants us to recognize them and accept and acknowledge that, that in spite of their flesh failure, remember Saul again. He had been chosen and anointed. That's why David called him that. He was used by God. The anointing of God had been on him. David had the attitude, when God wants to remove him, he will. But until that time, I am to recognize his place. Now, Let's say you got, we could use any car, but let's say tonight you got a brand new Lincoln Town car. And you say, if brand spanking new, I bet you'd come into the church saying something like this. I got a brand new spotless Lincoln Town car. You might even call it a, a, a new signature executive Lincoln Town Call because you're, oh, you're, you're going to take care of it. You're so proud of it. It's so new to you. It's so precious to you. You call it its whole long name. Ever notice that when we get something new? Well, oh, I don't just have, I have the limited edition. I have the whatever edition. It's spotless. But six months may pass, and you, now you're just calling it your Lincoln. Not as spotless anymore. And in two years, you just call it my car. Came here in my car, and it's dirty. You know why? Because how precious something is to you. You refer to it different. You talk about it different. You take care of it different because you value it different. The same with all people and all things, how you refer to them, how you treat them, how you take care of them. One of the biggest problems that causes deterioration in relationships, in marriage. This is really good. Every married couple or anybody who might hope to be someday needs to listen to this good. Is people losing the honor and the respect and the value for each other. Honor literally has the concept of value. Remember, we learned that in the first couple lessons. It was measured. I mean, they're, they're using a measurement thing in, in the Greek of how they measured when they had to lay gold and silver on the scale. That's what it, 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 the connotation is. If you honor something, you value it. God speaks to both husbands and wives about honoring each other in the New Testament. God commands wives to honor and respect their husbands in Ephesians 5 was waiting for the amen. <laughs> That's a sweet husband who didn't do that. And then in 1 Peter, he tells men to honor their wives and to love their wives. This is the thing that will protect and sustain and cause relationships to grow. Here's the problem. Over a period of time, many take one another for granted. How about a few years ago, this is the way they described each other. Come on, you're going to have fun with this, but this is the truth. They said things like this. This is my amazing wonder woman, my sweetheart, my queen. She says, this is my amazing man, my handsome husband, my brave man, my strong man. And after a few years, they say, or if they don't say it, they insinuate or think it. This is the cross I must bear. <laughs> they may not always say it, but they get to those places. Maybe not necessarily. Here's the sad part. Sometimes it might be because the husband and wife has changed and is doing some cruddy things. But most of the time, they haven't lost their value or they haven't uh, uh, started doing anything to warrant that. It's that the other one quit valuing and honoring them. 
and when you don't value people or treat them in a certain way, how many know people don't like being around you when you don't feel v valued? Do you guys like to go anywhere where people don't care if you're there or not? Have you ever been in a place like that? One of the things that a friend of mine said a couple weeks ago, she said, you know, I knew something was going on in the church. We're invited to a church event, and it just got icy when we walked in. If anything, it should be overboard the other way when the pastor walks in. She says, I knew there was this little session before we got there. And sure enough, she found out later there was. Somebody told her. But, um, but in any, I'm not just talking about a church setting, relative setting, friend setting, party setting. You're just like, you know, I'm kind of busy. Oh, you're here. <laughs> Instead of, oh, look who just walked in. Nobody likes to be where you feel that way. Oh, it's them. Does that make you want to come back? No, you want to leave. Do you enjoy going where you are not appreciated? But boy, when you can tell they want to be with you, that's the people you want to be with. Here's what I'm getting to. The Holy Spirit is like that. He wants to go where he's appreciated. Not, oh, him again. Oh, well, somebody just went, well, got touched. So what? We expect that. We're a Pentecostal church. Instead of, Oh, it's just like the first time I'm in awe of you touching me or touching someone else or honoring us with your presence. He wants to go where he's appreciated. That's where he will invest himself, where he's appreciated and honored. When God manifests his presence, his healing, his glory, he's honoring us with his presence. So, but what is that in response to? It's always in response to us honoring him first. This is a key to our hearts having what they hunger for. The more we learn how to respect and reverence his things, the more we will see and he will share with us. When he sees how we value everything that's his, the worship from the first moment, the first chord is, is struck uh, or the first prayer is given. Oh, nobody's going to have to coax. Come on, people. Let's put our arms up tonight. Let's pray. No, I'm ready to honor him. I'm ready to receive him. I'm, I'm ready to let him know how glad I am he's here and how expectant that I am that he's going to be here. His words, his people, his presence, how we value his things the more he will come and give us more. Now in showing preference, does anybody in here have their favorite piece of jewelry? I think most people, I don't care. I'm not talking about that it has to be worth $40,000, but maybe a, maybe a $100 watch versus your $12 Timex or something. You got a favorite piece of jewelry. Um, I, as Brother Keith Moore was talking about this, he says he has several watches. And he said, I'm not ashamed of one of them. I love it when he's preaching one side of something, but he keeps adding this side in too to come against the religious anti-prosperity. Uh, uh, he's talking about the heart of the matter, but he's saying, but I'm not ashamed of any of the watches I have. He said, every one of them, somebody gave him. He said he has a painting hanging in his house from Europe. He has a grand piano in his home. And he says, I haven't paid one penny for anything in that room. But he said, I know the religious person would come in my house and say, how many offerings did that take to pay for all that stuff? And he said, I never spent a dime for any of it. He said, they've all been given to me by precious people. And I received preferential treatment. He said, but when I get a watch like the one I was given from Switzerland, I don't just throw it in the drawer beside the one that I wear when I go swimming, my Timex. He said it gets its own special place to be put in, um, a preferential spot. Did you know we're supposed to do that with people? But the anti, oh, these preachers think they're such big stuff anyway, and they all are in it for the money, and they're all in it because they got to have a lot of honor, and they're all in it to be big shot. That, that thing has permeated the body of Christ more than the big shots have permeated the body of Christ until now people don't even think there should be any preference. But as we continue in this, I, I think you'll see the difference. He says, we're supposed to be that way with people. He said, my Bible is not thrown in a corner with the magazines. He said, I've written stuff in my Bible. God has spoken to me special things about times and seasons, and I don't want just anyone running off with my Bible. He said, even when people in certain churches come to take it, because most people are trained to do that for ministers and churches, he said, that's the only thing I won't let them take. I hang on to my Bible. You know, it's funny because, um, not my Bible, but, but uh, I left my, my notebook before I was using an iPad. 
I left my notebook on Pastor Rodney's pulpit one time after I finished preaching and he comes up next and I see him coming and you're kind of nervous anyway. And I just thought, just clear the stage and give him room and forgot my, forgot my notebook up there of all my sermons. I sat down and thought, oh no, my notebook is up there and it's in his way. And he's got that, that plastic podium that you can see everything through it. And, and so that's so typical of him. He doesn't just let anything go. He has to have some fun with anything but you never know if it's going to be fun or if it's going to be the reprimand. So I'm watching him. He doesn't start preaching. Everybody's waiting for him. What's he doing? He's taking my notebook, and this is what he's doing. And I'm like, oh, he's going to say something, and I don't know what it's going to be. I think he's doing that for like eight minutes. You know, It felt like an eternity. And he goes, this is yours, right, Debbie? Yeah, sorry, didn't mean to leave it up there. This is absolutely, and I'm waiting, <laughs> awesome. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and he said, I've never seen anything quite like this in this organized. Man, I'd like to look at this. And it was my notebook. And he said, however, I'm going to tell you something. Don't leave it in pulpits. Somebody is going to take all your notes. And he said, you wouldn't believe how many Bibles I've had stolen by preachers. And I thought, dear God, help the body of Christ. But I thought about that when I was hearing Brother Keith Moore. He says, nobody takes my Bible. It gets preferential treatment. And then he went on to say, and, and you know, I don't make any bones about it. I've used some of Brother Keith Moore stuff. I've used some of John Bevere's stuff, and I'm adding in a lot of my own stuff and my own stories. But he went on to say, that they, as he was talking about this, he says, we're about to have special meetings. And he said, we're going to give people some special seating because the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. He said, but I know it also says to be no respecter of persons. And how do you rightly divide that? He says, does that mean that everyone gets the same treatment? Absolutely not. You don't treat people different because of their flesh, because they have some money. And I'll add, because they can do something for you or they've accomplished some things in the flesh or some success in the world. But you do show some honor and respect to people who've been faithful serving God for 50 years, people whose lives and commitment to God and to the ministry have changed millions of lives. He said they shouldn't have to stand outside in a line. They should have a special door and special seats. We're to give every believer a special preference just because you're a believer and because you're a Christian. Not just giving someone a cup of cold water because they're thirsty or because they happen to have a want or a need, but because they are a child of God. We're not just doing this as a man, but as a disciple and a child of God, honoring and preferring one another. And then he talked about, again, how much has been lost the last few years. People seem to get in a ditch one way or another. It's either all pomp and circumstance, and it is in some places, and just someone trying to impress someone. I remember, this isn't in my notes, but it just came to me. I remember in some of Brother Rodney's early meetings after his ministry exploded, after the Lakeland revival and 10,000 people, you know, morning and night for six weeks. And I don't remember how many thousand baptized in water. And it went viral and global. Well, every halfway known charismatic minister started coming to his meetings after that. But, you know, they came later and later. I'm not talking about 10 minutes late. I'm not talking about 15 minutes late. They started coming in like an hour and an hour and a half late because then the usher brings them up here, makes people scoot over. and Then we all get to see, oh, that's so-and-so of the most famous church. That's so-and-so on TV. Oh, look, that's... And I'll never forget the day. Pastor Rodney is not one, whether he was an evangelist or even now as a pastor. I've never seen him change in this. He'll lay it out the way it is. And if people don't like it, he always says, you can hit the back door. And he says, all right, no more. No more special seating for all you pompous pastors that just want to show off your big ministries and come in so late to be noticed. If you aren't here within, and that's when they change, I don't know what it was, 15 minutes or whatever. If you aren't here and you don't care enough, you don't need to praise the Lord because you're too big for that. You don't need to, to be in, in the beginning of anything because you're way beyond that. If you come in like that, you'll sit in the back or wherever it is. I'm not putting up with this junk anymore. 
And some of them had just come in when he said that. I thought, okay, don't anybody look now? He doesn't care. And he didn't care. And we did lose some of them. So, yes, there is that pompous junk on the other side. But just because of that, you don't want to go in the ditch the other way just because somebody else is trying to impress somebody. Um, it's not about what little finger to hold out and when you drink the teacup. It's not all that stuff. And it's not about just people needing a big to-do made over them because they want to be the hottest thing in town. It's not just trying to be noticed, but we're talking about honoring God when you do it for people. God takes it personally. And then he, he reminded us of something I think I've even shared in another one of the classes we've had on Wednesday night, not in this course, but in another course about when Brother Keith and Phyllis in the early days of their ministry and they had their car break down, they went to six different places about a mile apart. It was a cold, rainy night. Nobody would help them or nobody was home. They'd have to go a mile in the other direction. And finally, they came to one place that people were a different color and of a different denomination. But when they found out they were Christians, oh, my goodness, the red carpet that they laid out and how special they treated them. He said they built a fire in their little mobile home and they didn't have a phone, but they said, you don't need to walk anyplace else. We're going to put you in our car and we'll keep going until we find you a phone. And they just went out of their way and fed them. And, and um, he said, let me pay you. You've been pay you. You've been so hospitable. And they said, pay us. Of course not. We're Christians and you're Christians. If we can't help each other out, what is life all about? And that's, we should be that giving one to another preferential treatment that others want to get in on it just because of how we love one another. They want to get treated like that too. Dr. Summerall, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but it bears repeating. He's gone now. He said with their Feed the Hungry program, we will only feed the Christians and he's right now, I realize there's going to be some people lying and it's going to be hard to sort out. But if he knows they're Muslims, he knows they're Hindus, he knows they're atheists, forget it. He said other people don't like that. But if you study scripture, it talks about loving one another, doing things for one another. And he said, I want to illustrate it that if you serve the wrong God, you get the wrong results. Our God feeds, our God takes care of his people. And um, he said we should help our own believers and our Christians first. And I, I struggle with that line being where we are in Aberdeen. We want to reach out to this neighborhood. We want to get them in here. But finding that line between people who just want to take the soup and the handout and the fish and not want to learn how to fish and won't even stay for the service. And then they keep you an hour afterwards with bizarre stories because their minds are gone and they're counseling, but tell you they aren't going to come to church here. No, that's not what we're here for. Not at all. In 2 Kings chapter 4, I was going to read it, but you know the story. I shared it when I taught on giving a few weeks ago. But in 2 Kings 4, 8 through 17, we have the story of the Shunammite. And, you know, we've talked about it. She must have been a good cook. He must have liked it. <laughs> did she say, I perceive that he's an old preacher and I feel sorry for him? No. What did she say? This is a holy man of God. She wanted things changed in her life. And shouldn't we still use that kind of language today? People will say the man of God, the child of God. Sometimes wives of pastors refers to their husband as the man of God or the pastor, and that's good. He may be just Jim or Bob at home, but he's the man of God in front of the church. It teaches people the things of God. She said, let us make a little chamber building a bedroom onto the house. Is that preferential treatment? Did they do that for everybody? No. He's getting preferential treatment, time and money. Did she honor God in honoring Elijah? She said, we're going to give him a place of hospitality, and we're going to have a lot of people coming for meetings, and, and we're going to give him the best room in the house. Now, getting back to Brother Keith, he said, we've got some meetings coming up with some people who have never been shown respect. You know what he decided to do was invite a lot of old ministers that were now old that were instrumental in his life when he was a boy, sowing seed into him. And he decided to bring them to a conference and honor them. He said many of them have never been shown respect. He said it'll cause them to bloom and blossom. And, uh, and uh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. There's another spot where he's talking about when they had him in. 
He said not only did they give him the best hotels and the best seats and honor them and introduce them like they had never been introduced in their lives, but he said many of you in the congregation walked up and gave him Holy Ghost handshakes. How many know what that is? With money in the hand, besides the offerings they got. And he said, we put them in nice cars and drove them around. He said, most of them were, he said, most of them were crying, saying, we've never been treated like this once in our life. And he said, then it's high time that you are. Remember the stories I shared a couple weeks ago of the church in Georgia that said, we know who you are. God knows who you are. You just don't know who you are. This will be the first limousine you're ever in. And we will be able to say we did it and that we gave you a back room and that we, because you don't know what God has put in your life. And then he goes on to say it'll cause him to bloom and blossom. He said he was somewhere taking his car to get fixed. And guys, these big, high-class execs were in their suits, barking at the blue-collar mechanics, demanding this. And the tension was so thick in the air because it was so busy in that garage. And he said he looked down at the guy working on stuff, and he could see his name on his shirt with his blue collar. And uh, this is just the example he used, Mr. Bob. He says, Mr. Bob, I see that you're very busy. And if you don't have time to get to me today, I understand. I just need to tell you, I just need for you to tell me what I need to do. Do I need to leave my car? Do I need to come back a day you aren't so busy or what? And uh, he said, I had already prayed and asked God for favor. But he said, you don't go in there stomping your feet and demanding or it will undo your prayer. And when he called him Mr. Bob, he stood up and looked at him and said, where's your car? He said he walked around everybody, all those big executives showing off and get this done for me and I, I have a fast life and I need my car by noon. And he said that mechanic walked around all those people and took him to his car and uh, he stared at him like, uh, and, and, and the other people were staring at him like, how did you do that? He said it was by honoring him and treating him decently and not stomping around or not acting like he thought he was better than him. And uh, he got his car done first and the rest of them had to wait. But he said, again, he had those ministers in and treated him like that. And, and um, he said they were so blessed, so blessed. And he said, I want to make this place a place of hospitality to ministers around the world where they're treated like they aren't treated anywhere else. And he said, in doing that, we're showing honor to God. The Shunammite's husband could have pitched a fit. I don't want that man coming up here all the time, eating our groceries. <laughs> and if we're going to build on the house, we'll build a room for us first. We've been wanting to do some construction around here. Why should we do it for them first? He said, they wouldn't even have been in the Bible. But they gave him a nice, quiet place to be and fed him. They honored God by honoring him. And if you honor God, what have we been saying every week? What did he say he'll do for us? Honor us. And you don't go two more verses without seeing him say, call this Shunammite. What's to be done for her? How many know that's God? What, now what do you want? You honored me through my people. Now what do you want? If you keep blessing God's people... It's going to keep coming up before God. She answered, I don't need anything. And Gehazi said, she doesn't have a child. But in a year's time, she did. Talk about being honored by God, an impossible miracle. That's some real honor being shown back to her. He honored her, and it wasn't the end of it. We know what happened. The boy died, had a stroke in the field, sunstroke, whatever it was. God raised him up. Do you think that woman might have felt that it was just maybe worth a couple pieces of furniture and a little money? In a little time, a few groceries. And later on, in a time of famine, and they had to leave the country, she came back, went before the king. And as she did, Gehazi was already talking to the king. Well, there's the woman now that I've been telling you about. All of her land, everything was returned to her. How many think <laughs> that they probably thought that was a pretty cheap bedroom? Amen? But see, they had a choice when that happened. They didn't know the famine was coming. They didn't know they were about to have a son. They didn't know he was about to die. They didn't know any of those things. And people today don't think like that. When you think about the church's needs, they think it's costing me too much. Special meetings, that's going to cost us again. We just had somebody in here costing us. They want their ministers to be comfortable. That's just throwing money away. Investments of the greatest kind are in any of the gospel reaching people, honoring God's people, causing the church to be fired up. That is the greatest investment we can do out there anywhere. 
we need to stand up and honor God from the first moment. We're not honoring flesh, but honoring God, the anointing and graces and gifts he's put upon people's lives. And he will honor us with his presence, with his finances, with miracles, with healings, with respect, with promotions that others don't get. He'll spare your life. We sang it, your deliverer. You're, he will spare, I wonder how many times my life has been spared that I don't even know about in honoring somebody else when I could have copped an attitude, I could have got grouchy, I could have. Now, we're going to get into a third thing you do in practically walking out honor. We said reference, we said preference, and here's another rhyming one. It makes them easy to remember, deference. Again, 1 Samuel 2.20, them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. God's speaking here, not man. If you honor me, I promise you, I will honor you. Is it a great thing for God to honor us? Absolutely, you can count on it. He'll do it. And then he went on to say, though, they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. And we talked about this, but we got to talk about this some more. Another way of saying despise is just lightly esteeming. How many of us, I heard John Bevere say it, I heard Keith Moore say it, and I had to agree. If I heard somebody say, I despise you, or I despise this church, I used to would have thought that meant they hate it. They hate. But in the Greek, that's not what the word is. It's, it's okay. It's okay, I guess. It's to lightly esteem, and that's, that's a surprise to many people, including me. Um, it includes a broader idea failed to value or appreciate, treat it as lightly. Oh, that's just somebody preaching from that old book again. That old book? Or when we're worshiping, what good is all that? They're saying that now 15 times. They could have, we got it the first time. What's the big deal? Failing to appreciate the value or the importance of something. We live in a generation where people are taught little on honor. We've lost a lot of ground. And so we're taking our time with it. It's a noble thing to be teaching. It's essential to receiving from God. It's as necessary to receive from him as when we got saved. You can't get saved unless you value the work of the cross, can you? You might say a prayer to make a girlfriend, a boyfriend happy, or, okay, I'll say your prayer, and that's what's happening with a lot of people. But it's not until you, they value, he took my place. His blood was poured out for me. I see that. I esteem that. I, I appreciate it. I value it. Then they get born again. It has to mean something to you. You have to value it, esteem it. Now, in the Bible, is it just a collection of old literature? It's the living word of God. It will not pass away. There's life. There's healing. There's deliverance. There's revelation. There is a call. There is everything I need right in these living words. It's not just an old book. Jesus said, take heed with how, how you hear. For with the same measure you esteem it, it'll be met back to you. Take heed what you hear, how you hear. We said, I think in the first service, it's something how two people can be in the same service, sitting side by side, listening to the same thing. One leave bored, one leave change. I'll take it a step further because I've had it before. One leave mad, the other one going, thank you, that so challenged me, and I had to ask God about it and get free. Why can that happen with two people sitting side by side? How they take heed to what they hear. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 and 13, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Listen to this. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. Paul says you could have. You could have just said that was that's just Paul's opinion up there. But you received it as the truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. He said, that's why it's working in you, because of the way you received it. People might go, how come I can't get healed? How come I can't get this? How come, how come I can't do this or this? How about, how are we receiving things? Are we receiving them such as, that's just her thought up there, adding that. I don't think that's true. Or are we receiving it of God? Why did that do that? Do I need to examine a place right there? Not as the word of men, but of God. A revelation of why the word works for some and not for others. Some receive it as the Lord, honoring and ministering to them, and others as just talk and a waste of time. There are many people not in church today because they don't see the point. That's my time to sleep, my time to play, my time to veg out on the couch, my time to watch TV. 
They don't see the value like you and I do. Why did you come tonight? Why did you come out in the cold and the wet and get dressed? Maybe there's a good show on, order a pizza, because of the same reason I did. We value the presence and the spirit of the living God. We value the word of God. Why do we pray? That's interesting because that's really hard to get people to do anymore. When we pray, we don't hear an audible voice. I mean, somebody might on a very special occasion, but not usually. We don't see anyone. That's because, and that's why most people think it's foolish, even people in church. We do it because we know he hears us. We know he answers prayer. We know that things actually happen. And they will not happen automatically. It's when God's people come out and begin to pray. How can people give their hard-earned money? Because they believe in something and value the work of God. As I was saying earlier about Brianna and the healings, that makes stuff worth it. When we were Skyping Eat It and Eric today, they were talking about sometimes their discouragement as he continues to have meetings. Why go in for a weekend and the church goes back to being dead? Why? So that's from an evangelist point of view. The pastors I've been talking to, why continue when people don't want it? They just want a little. Nut. Everybody has reasons that the enemy's trying to tell them to give up, to take it a little easier, to it's not doing anything anyway. But if we esteem this and we esteem that we're almost home and the real rewards are about to be laid out then, we're getting mighty, mighty, mighty close. If we really believe that and really esteem that, we keep going. It's a God thing. We believe in prayer. Somebody prayed and asked the Lord to do something. We know he's doing it. Some despise prayer and preachers, but we esteem the ministries and the churches and the people of God. And again, the Lord's very big in delegation. He says, if you don't receive the ones I send, you don't receive me. If you don't receive me, you don't receive the Father. If you don't receive us, you don't receive the Holy Spirit. You don't receive the one I sent, forget it. So when you receive his word and he receive his word and his people, you're honoring God. We receive the things of God. We're honoring him. The way we show love and respect and honor for his people is the same as how we show love and respect and honor unto God. Brother Keith was ministering somewhere and praying. I thought this was such a good story. I've got some of them I can add to it here. He said he's in this church and he's praying about the service and the revival meeting he's supposed to do in that church. And he said, God brought a minister to his heart in his mind that was a thousand miles away. He said, I wasn't thinking about this man. I didn't know what kind of car he drove. I hadn't seen him in forever. And he said, the spirit of God spoke to me and said, his car is not adequate. It displeases me. Does that surprise you? Really? Does God care about things like that? How many know it's not so much that God cares about cars, but he cares about you and your car is a necessary tool to doing kingdom business. And so it's so surprised brother Keith, cause he's praying about this meeting, not this man when God said that. And he thought, well, God, what about it then? You want to talk to me about this? What about it? You want me to do something about it? He said, as soon as you get home, you get in that little airplane I gave you. He said it was all paid for. I want you to go over there and see that man. He'll uh, just go to the area and he'll hear that you're there and he'll call you and ask you to preach for him. He said, I want you to go do it. And when you get there, tell the people, listen to this, that their pastors are a gift to me. Tell them if they don't value them, they could lose them and they could wind up with someone who appreciates them. Now, before I finish this story, I've been here several times. In Nome, Alaska, where you've heard me say that I still feel like was the best revival I've had anywhere in the world. I went there, that church exploded. They loved the revival. Their pastor loved the revival. They, <laughs> I've never seen a church so jump in the entire church. I went back there a few months later, it was the same way. I went back the next year, it was the same way. I went back the next year, it was the same way. But I think it was about four years into it that I went back and I thought, something's different in here. I could tell the pastor was still very on fire, but something's different in here. Can't put my finger out, and I'm just preaching my, my own business with the message I knew God gave me. And right in the middle of it, I began to prophesy. And when I heard what was coming out of my mouth, I thought, <gasps> 
Oh, I haven't heard the pastor say he's even thinking about leaving. He's going to have my neck. Why am I saying this? And what did I, I just kept my eyes closed. But I heard myself saying, God said to tell you, if you do not appreciate this revival pastor that you have, God will remove him and take him somewhere else, and you will be without revival. And when I finished and we went back to the pastor's house, he said, oh, my goodness, Debbie. He said, as usual, you were right on target. He said, Dory and I made sure we didn't talk to you about any of this, but something's happened in our church. They just aren't hungry like they used to be. And he said, we're thinking of moving if they don't get hungry. And I thought, wow, okay, Lord, you interrupted my sermon to tell the truth. But how many know God does that for a reason? What did God want to have happen? He wanted the people to go, we're sorry, we're sorry, we'll get hungry. But as usual, many people take that as an affront that just... I'm hungry. Who does she do? They didn't take it as God just interrupted that. She was prophesying. Who was she to tell me? They let the whole thing die. God moved that pastor on. But eventually, through a series of things, a lot happened with him and his wife too. But do you know a few of those people have now found me on Facebook. For all I know, they might be watching tonight after all these years. They ended up with people behind that pulpit that didn't know a thing about revival, didn't want revival. And they're all like, Pastor Debbie, would you ever consider coming to know him again? Boy, they've been in the desert a long time, and that didn't have to be. God gave them one of the greatest gifts, not only in me coming. What are the chances of an evangelist who's just gotten hooked up with Brother Rodney going to Nome, Alaska, uninvited, have to pay your own airfare, you're about kicked out of town? God did all of that to put revival on their doorstep, and they went with it for a while, and then just the things of life, and que sera, sera. So as as I'm reading this story, my mind's about a lot of places I've been and what God's told me to tell the people as well. So the Lord spoke to him and said, (laughs) he says, when I got there, sure enough, he said, you don't have to tell everything you know. He said, I didn't tell the man everything God spoke to me. I just went to the area. And he said, the man called me and said, Brother Keith, I hear you're in town, just like God said would happen. Would you like to come preach for me? And he said, yeah, I think I'd like to. That'd be good. He didn't say, yes, that's what I'm doing here, and I have a message for your church. He just said, yeah, I think I would. And he said, God gave him a message on God gave gifts unto men out of Ephesians. And in the middle of it, he said, now I'm going to tell you something. Your pastor is, is uh, driving a piece of junk. Actually, Brother Keith said it was a piece of pitiful junk. And he said, God told me he's displeased with it. And he told me to give you an opportunity to do something about it. But he also told me that if you don't, that I was to do it. So I will do it if you don't. But I want to give you that opportunity. He said he no longer got it out of his mouth. And people came running from all directions with money. He said in one week, they had a Suburban, and he said it wasn't a normal Suburban. It was decked out with everything. He said there was a big screen in the back. It had every little whistle you could get on it. And he said not only that, in a year and a half, they built him a beautiful home. And he said not only that, he said God told him to tell the people that night, if you will obey me. You will keep what you have and be increased, and I will send you my best gifts. He said, do you know that church is so far out in the sticks? I don't know what state it's in. But he said, the pastor calls me every few months and says, guess who's coming now? And for Keith Moore's jaw to drop, I can't imagine who these ministers are, whether it's Jesse Duplantis, Kenneth Copeland, I don't know. But he says, the world's best goes to that little place out in the sticks. He said, not only that, but God told him to tell him, if you will honor me, there will be many new cars out here when I come back. And he said, today when you go there, everybody has new cars. He said, it doesn't go that way everywhere where he delivers the word of the Lord. But they took hold when he did that. And uh, they've had the best ministry gifts in the world coming to them ever since. 1 Thessalonians 5.12 says, to know them which labor among you and are over you and admonish you. Are there people who are over us? Yes. A lot of people don't like to even think about this. And they say, there isn't anybody any better than me. He didn't say those people were better than you or I. He said they were over you. Hebrews talks a lot about this. We have to understand this or our foundation isn't even there to show honor for whom honor is due. Why should someone even receive honor in ways others do not? 
We said that, that according to the Bible, everybody should not be treated the same, and they aren't all equal. They, they, we all get his blessings the same and salvation the same. He's loved us the same. We're all redeemed the same, but because of the rank. In Hebrews 13, 7, he says, those who rule over you. Another place in the Bible, same language, you need to consider people. Look at their life. Look at their fruit. Those the Lord put you under and joined you to follow them. You look at the 17th verse of Hebrews 13, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves to them. Here's what balances this. People are so terrified of that word submit, especially in this day and age. How many know that in the what? 70s, 80s, 80s, I think that crazy shepherdship movement that got out of hand where they were having to ask their pastor what kind of toothpaste to use. I mean, it was ridiculous. They would. They'd say, can I buy the Chevy or the Ford? I don't think that's, no, God has that car for you. Don't buy that one. And it got ridiculous. But here are some key things that will help set us free. Do you got just a few more minutes here? This is so good. Here's what balances it. It didn't say we're going to make you submit. This will keep the whole thing straight. It says you're going to submit yourself to them. Everybody knows what the Bible says about wives submitting themselves to their own husbands. A lot of people don't even think that's applicable today. They say, well, Paul just had a problem with women. Do we think it's the Holy Ghost who wrote this Bible? Or we do, do we think it was men? If we believe it's the Holy Ghost, it's either this way or it's not. We've got to make up our minds. But so many husbands and wives have been so messed up about that scripture. And I'm for one, one who lived in the horrible crud of somebody who wasn't even living for God, claiming to be saved, but there's about only one scripture he knew day and night as he hit you or as he cheated on you or as he threatened you or as he grabbed you by the throat. Wives, submit. You want a divorce? Just don't submit me to me one more time and you'll get one as the hands across the throat. So I know what it's like when people take this kind of a scripture and take it into the ditch. But listen to this. The Bible also says husbands love your wives like Christ loves the church. But here's the problem. Husbands and wives like to read each other's passages. You're supposed to submit to me. Well, you're supposed to love me like Christ loved the church. Well, if you submitted to me, I could love you like I should. Well, if you love me right, I could submit to you like I should. Here's the whole thing. We need to read our own mail. And the next time that we read it, when it says husbands, the wife needs to say, this ain't talking to me. This is none of my business. I'm not a husband. That's between him and God and not bring it up <laughs> and not say anything to him about it, how he's supposed to love you. And then when it says wives, the husband needs to say, that ain't talking to me. I, sh I shouldn't even be reading this. Does it say husbands make your wife submit? Is that what it says? No. If some husbands get a revelation of that, it'll change their lives. Some would say, well, what if she won't submit then? Guess what? Then she won't. And that's the end of it. And you have to just keep trusting God to change your heart. What if you won't submit to the Lord? Is he going to make you submit to him? No. He tells you and I to submit ourselves to him. But he's not going to make us do that. The scripture says you should, should submit yourself to the Lord. And my job is to tell you what the scripture says. But I can't make you and God can't make you. Wives submit themselves to their husband. People submit themselves to the leader. No one makes anyone show the honor, the respect, the deference. The Lord is not making us do anything. He doesn't just want us to come to church. He wants us to want to. He doesn't just want us to pray. He wants us to want to pray. He doesn't just want us to give. He wants us to want to give. Now, there are times in the middle of all of that because of stuff going on in our lives that we got to tell our own flesh, you want to do this and you will do this. But Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. You is the understood subject. For they watch for your souls as they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. You submit yourself. Who's going to make you submit? 
Who? You. You. I have a responsibility concerning this faith, this little flock. Flock. I am the shepherd. But listen to this. Jesus isn't called the good cowboy. This is so good, but the good shepherd. There's a big fundamental difference between how a cowboy handles a herd of cows and how a shepherd handles a flock of sheep. How many know another word for cowboys? Do you know what I'm getting at? What's another word they call them? Cow pokes. Have you ever wondered why they call them that? <laughs> because they get behind the cows sometimes and poke and drive the cows. But Eastern shepherds don't do that. They know their sheep. They call them by name and they follow them. They know every sheep by name. Can you imagine that? We'd call them, Fluffy, come here, spot your leg in behind. Come on, spot. White one, come here, <laughs> come here. Black tip, come here, come here. Every single one of them had a name. And the sheep would fall in behind like, just like pet dogs. He's leading them and they're following him. And that's the way Jesus leads. That's the way the local shepherds are supposed to be. Well, what if they won't follow? then they won't. They won't. However, they also have to remember that if they hang out in the back and won't follow, there are wolves back there. There's an enemy seeking whom he may devour, and my job is not to make people do what they should do, but set an example. Come on, let's do this. Let's press in together. Come on, let's pray together. Come on, let's be here together. Come on, let's overcome. Come on. Some will, some won't. And somebody might say, yeah, but they need to do it. Yeah, but God won't make them. Sometimes we wish the Holy Spirit would completely take over us, but he's not going to do it. The Holy Spirit is not a controlling, driving spirit like the devil is. He's the spirit of grace. He'll deal with us, but then it's up to you if you respond and obey. And all of us should be that way, of course. Hebrews 13, 24, salute all of them which have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Again, three times in this one chapter, the people who are over you. So there are individuals in the kingdom who have a different place, the place he went to it was that day with those people and preached on God gave gifts. When he finished, they followed. It could have gone another way. They could have said, I don't care who you are. You aren't coming in here and telling us we aren't taking care of our, our pastor and you have no business doing that. And since you're such a big shot, you go ahead and pay for it. They could have said that. Keith would have stepped up to the plate. He would have bought his car, and I bet he, they would be pastoring somewhere else today where, where the flock of God appreciated him, but nobody can make him. But they did respond that way, and it was good. <laughs> and God has continued to bless and bless and bless them, uh, bless them in a big way. Some people say, well, nobody ever built me a house or bought me a car. Yeah, and talking like that, they never will. If you don't believe in a work or church or people, don't pump money into them. But there ought to be a church somewhere you can hook up with. And the Lord said, if you honor him and his people and his things and his gifts, he'll send some of his best to you. And boy, is he sending his best to them. So by preference, by deference, Romans says, be kind to one another and honor preferring one another. And when you show honor by deference, deferring to people, I'm going to touch on this very quickly and then I'll let you go. When you defer Boy, this is so misunderstood in ministry that I know I'll have to continue it next week, but I'm just going to touch on it now. When you defer, you defer to the greater anointing, to the greater place. So much is misunderstood in these areas. That's why I say when I'm talking to young people, I don't care who they are and what, what message they'll take back. That was good what my husband said to someone. You need to learn to show some respect. It's going to cost them in the ministry later if they don't. Um, when I'm with Pastor Rodney, I shut my mouth unless he addresses me. The lesser to the greater. If I would be that way with Brother, I remember one time I got the courage to go up to ask Brother Hagen something after class. Oh, it took me like, I think it took me like three months. And I just happened to be walking in as he was one day. And I'm like, what's the question? I don't even remember what it is to this day. But I muttered it out and he barely spoke about two words as an answer. I remember thinking, that was it? But as I started listening more and more to Brother Keith Moore's relationship with him, the more I understood, you're going to see something here. <laughs> Do you believe it's important and worth our time to get these things right the way that God would have us to? Remember in Hebrews 7, the Bible reminds us about Abraham met with Melchizedek. How many know who we're talking about? The, the priest. 
And it says Abraham gave him a tenth of all. Do you know that was before the law, before Moses, before anything? That We can really get into that with tithing right there, but it's a whole other subject. Then it says Melchizedek blessed him. How many know Abraham was known in the entire area as a great, great man, a wealthy man, a great man? And of course, great in the things of God, out of all the people God could have chosen to be the father of faith. He's marked throughout all of eternity as the father of our faith. How many would say that's a great man? And the Bible says he was willing to offer up his only son for God and put us in a covenant with God that gave God a legal right to give us his only son. And if anyone ever asked God, he would have to say, my man was willing to do this for me and now I must be willing to do it for him. Wow, what an amazing covenant. So Abraham has a place in the church. He has a place in the kingdom of God. He has a place in the word of God. But when he met Melchizedek, do you know the Bible doesn't even tell us if those two ever met before? They may have never met before. He honored him immediately. He showed deference to Melchizedek and gave him a tenth of everything. Melchizedek was acting as priest, and we could talk about every Bible scholar as a different idea who they think he actually was, but at least he was acting as priest. Now, he turns around and speaks blessing over Abraham. Now, I'm going to tell you again, Brother Keith Moore says this, but when I heard him, I was laughing. I loved it so much because the same thing irritates me, and I thought it was only me. He said, there's so much legalism anymore. He said, you say, God bless you, and someone turns around and says, I am blessed. He says, well, then I guess you've got all you want, don't you? You don't want any of my blessing on you? He said, look at the Bible and see how much they blessed each other. He said, don't be so technical and try to show off and be so word-oriented. You're just showing your ignorance. Besides that, and I love this, he said, it's just plain rude to say that. He said, you don't want my blessing? What if I want to pay off your car? Well, would you like that blessing? Would you like more anointing imparted to you if I could give you money and you don't know it? He said, people have thought wrong in these areas. What if I spoke words of faith into you or over you? What should you say if someone says, bless you? How about this? Thank you. Another thing that is so missing in our society, I might add. And Hebrews 7, 6 says, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And then it goes on to say, the less was blessed of the better. Does the Bible use the word less and better? It does. So can we use the words less and better? Is there a lesser and a greater place, a greater rank, greater, excuse me, anointing? This wasn't just somebody off the street who came in. Abraham recognized the place of Melchizedek, as a, even though he was a great man himself, and he deferred to the greater anointing. We need more, much more understanding of these things. The less is blessed to the greater. In God, none of us would be intrinsically better than the other, but a greater rank and a greater place. Some who've never been in ministry, they haven't walked with God very long. Three, oh, I'll have to fix this before next time. Three days after they're saved, decide they're a prophet, and they want to come and lay hands on you. Brother Keith was talking about, they'll want to come and lay hands on me. You don't know how much of that I've had through the years. Every place, you can just about count on it unless they're taught really well. A good faith church, it's not going to happen. But everywhere else, uh, as soon as I'm, I'm done praying for people or if I'm just taking a break, oh, man, God wants me to pray for you. I don't know who they are. I don't know where their hands have been. And some of them you can look at and about guess, I don't want those hands in me. About guess, I don't want those hands in me. Other ones, you're not sure. What are they even thinking? First of all, they're there to receive of the gift that week. They're not there to bless the evangelist. They're there to receive of the gift. But I'm thinking, what are they thinking? But I've always been polite. Some of them I say, well, and so we started announcing as Brother Rodney did in his meetings, nobody laying hands on people. That doesn't, that didn't even, didn't even detour anybody. I know you don't want people laying hands, but I'm, I've been called by God to lay hands on you. Is that all right? Now listen to this closely. <laughs> Most of the time that would be inappropriate. Somebody just a little young thing in God excited about their ministry and their anointing. And then they come to somebody like Brother Hagen, 65 years in the ministry, been privileged with visitations of Jesus walking in and having conversations with him. The less is blessed to the greater, inappropriate to turn that around. We don't want to be mean, but at the same time, we've got to smile and say, no, I don't want you to lay hands on me. 
many times they don't have anything to offer or give. And that's not to say, you always want to leave this room. That's not to say that God couldn't use someone young in ministry who really does have something to give. But guess what? In that case, the other one will know that by the Spirit. And when they know that, they may make an exception. And I've done that a few times and say, yeah, go ahead and minister. I've even gone up to people and asked them to pray for me when the Holy Ghost told me to. So you leave room for those exceptions. But in that case, it shouldn't be that that one goes, I knew it. I knew I had something to give them. It should be that that person receives that you were honoring them by allowing them to pray for you because God said we're making an exception in this case. Um, the, the person of the lesser place should acknowledge the greater place by deferring to them. The person of the greater place can show honor to the lesser place by being gracious and both involve honor. Now, let me qualify it with this. And I hope, unless I am blinder than Usually people are blind in areas that they don't know, but I believe this is one of my stronger areas. He goes on to teach, just because you're the head of a place doesn't mean everyone has to adapt to every little whim of yours that isn't talking about faithfulness to the house of God or the word of God or anything. He says, if you're a godly person, you'll be gracious. If it's something you just have a personal preference about, not something you heard from God about, you could say, well, what would you like to do with it? Well, I'd rather go to McDonald's or no, I want to go to Burger King. I know I'm in charge, but let's go where you want to go. In doing so, they're showing honor by saying, we'll go where you want. But you should show the honor by saying, you're in charge. We give you first choice and you make the choice. I've seen it work in every area with husbands and wives, all kinds of stuff. Um, I, I was laughing tonight telling Taylor this because when he talked about the movie, he said, I know you've really been wanting to see this one and he has it over there and with her thing, they can clear out the yuck. And he said, but he, he talked Charlotte. No, 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 you, no, you understand where I'm going. You got to wait till I'm done. And I mean, I know. And, and she doesn't want, cause she wants to see something happy, not somebody who dies at the end. And I said very quickly, you guys watch whatever you want. I couldn't care less. Now, could I say, does it have anything to do with the church? No. But could I say you asked me first? I'm the past. And some are like that. Believe me. We're watching this. Bless God. I wanted to watch this for three weeks. But I said, I couldn't care less. You know what's the fun part? It's all hanging out and having popcorn. Yeah. And he mentioned a couple movies. Quite frankly, I don't care for either one of them. I'm not a superhero person at all. But did I say, I won't watch a superhero movie? I said, that's fine. That's great because it doesn't have anything to do with us coming up higher or us and, and people who walk around, don't you know who you're talking to? I'm in charge. I'm trying to show you something tonight that this isn't about somebody taking a place of, bless God, I'm in charge and we will have blue chairs. There are things when we started the church, I wanted to work in the bathrooms first. It was just my own preference. I don't know. We still have it. I mean, we've put a lot of money into a lot of things. We will one of these days. But I gave into the general thing. I thought these are mechanics. They are, they are, I could say, I'm deciding this. I'm going to decide what we do with the money. I could and probably not have a church. And besides that, it has nothing to do with anything. Okay, if we think the kitchen's more important or we think, you know, whatever is more important. It's about, those things aren't important. And I try to live that out as an example to the best of my ability. I say to people all the time, wherever you want to go eat, especially these days, because I can't even eat a meal. <laughs> I just pick it whatever anybody gets, whatever, wherever you want to go. But let me say this on the other side of the thing. When it comes to the things of God, I will not give in. I will not give in. I will have a revival church or I won't have a church. I'll have one where we're on fire or because, because we, there's been a lot of other choices. I'm not saying it was what God wanted, but you have a lot of choices in the natural. Could have got a house in Florida. We refused it. Could have hooked up with other ministries. We refused it. I'm still getting some hints and some directions where we could still hook up with ministries and have refused it. We believe God's called us here, but we believe God's called us here to have a faith church. And I told LaShawn this, and I told some other people this who've been getting discouraged lately because a lot of people have that I've talked to. I said, you know what? I can see, because somebody said to me, don't you think it's easier to just pioneer a church with fresh people and just the, w everything, you know, all like cars? I said, that's what we all were. That's what we, that we and uh, I said, but here's the thing. And I said, the same with you, where you are, all the people I'm talking to that are kind of going through stuff lately. I said, 
God wants a faith, Holy Ghost, speaking the word church everywhere. And look how few there are of them. Look how, so all of hell knows that. And all of hell is going to try to get us to back down and compromise until we're just like every other church out there. That, well, you know, we have a nice word and we come on Sunday mornings and, you know, we, we're going to heaven. We even maybe once in a year have a message in tongues. And you know how many of them there are right here in Aberdeen without going to Montesano, without going to Hoquiam, without just like that? That's not why we're persevering. So if I get stronger than I've ever been, like I was on Sunday, I do realize that. Because I told my husband, when you, and, and LaShawn said, when you come to my church, here's what she said, because this is why all of us revivals were changed, tr trained at the river. She said, let her rip and clean house. And she said, if I don't have anything left, then bless God, I'll start with nobody all over again. But we will have a revival church, not a halfway I said, well, thank you for saying that in the evangelist hat. You can do it easier than you, you can in your own, in your own atmosphere. But, uh, but I told my husband Sunday, I said, you know what? We can all agree and say amen to yes, let's go on the same journey Richard's going on. That's why I brought him back here Sunday. Yes, amen. That's great. We got to come up higher. But then if you have to start pointing out how you come up higher, oh, those things should all be left to us. Then what does a preacher do? Just say, in generalities, we need to come up higher. Amen. And nobody thinks about, when you ask questions, what do we spend our money on? What do we love? What do we spend our t time on? What do we think about the most? What do we talk about the most? All those things we ask to take our temperature. Those are going to get uncomfortable. How much do we press through? How do They've always been uncomfortable to me as I've always been presented with them by all the revivalists I've been under. But every time I've been presented with them, I can honestly say before God, I sat there and went, yep, yep, that needs to change too, yep. And I can't tell you how many services the tears were rolling down my face on the front row when Pastor Rodney walked up to me and he said, wow, Debbie, I, I, you don't think I was just preaching at you or something, do you? No, wasn't that. I know it was to everybody, but I just took it to me that I've got to come up higher, that I've got to make some changes. Because my job as shepherd of the flock, who will stand before God someday, and he'll go, remember when I sent you to Aberdeen to have a true revival church? But you could tell some things were starting to make people uncomfortable. So you started backing off, and you became just like all the other churches in the area. But, it, but they liked you, didn't they? I'm going to go, Ooh, that's why I've been so encouraged. I've said uh, not to point you out too many times here, Neil, lately. But this man has so encouraged me the last couple of weeks of I've gone home, I've examined my heart, I've searched the scriptures, and I've come up wanting. And I'm coming up higher, and I can see it in him. And I can see it in many of you. I'm not just singling him out. We do different people <laughs> at different times. The point being, I don't know how I got there from here. <laughs> I don't remember what we were last in. But uh, the point being, as the shepherd, as the shepherd, God is calling us in this hour, starting with me, to not business as usual, but everything our hearts long for. Things like the next time we have somebody in here with cancer, the next time we have somebody in here battling for their life, don't we want to see it go the other way? Well, we can do one of two things. Go, well, it just happens, I don't know. Or we can go, God, we're missing it somewhere. We're missing it somewhere. Lord, help us to press in more. Help us to have greater revelation. Help us to walk out these things. And if he starts to talk to us about some of these things, then we got we to gotta all come up to it. Because that's his will and his plan for us to have a Holy Ghost miracle place where people are getting saved and delivered. I don't want to just meet somebody in Denny's next time who says I'm Lucifer. I want to go shkatira soto korabe and ride in Denny's, boom, and get something. I've met the Lord. I'm not satisfied. I'm just like Richard. I'm not satisfied where we are. And my job is to say, Lord, show us how to get there. 
And I honestly believe one of the things he started working on months ago was this honor series. Not, and if somebody misunderstands the whole thing and thinks all oh, these weeks and these months are about calling Pastor Debbie, Pastor Debbie instead of Deb. That's not what it's about. It's ultimately about welcome Holy Spirit. We're hungry. We're pressing in. We're making room for you. We're learning to defer to you, to prefer you, to revere you. Uh, we're, we're learning in everything we do, every testimony, every prayer meeting, every song we sing, every sermon we preach, everything we teach, how we wait on you, how we linger on you, how we come up for prayer. We are learning to prefer you over our flesh, over the things we want to do, over the things until we want to do what you want us to do for a while we got to do it this way this way until one way one day you just want what he wants in everything Amen. there are still days do I dare say this there are still days that I go on Tuesday and Friday oh it's 11 o'clock we got to be at the church at 12 Oh, I was just going to start my workout. I was just, oh, why did I start this Tuesday and Friday thing? Can I be that honest with you? Oh, great. I got clothes in the wall. Oh, why didn't I think of this earlier? Because we haven't been in the pattern long enough for it just to be like Wednesday night and Sunday morning. So what do I have to do? Get down there. Finish the wash later. Maybe you can't do the workout today. Maybe I'll have to do it tonight. Great, I'm going to get down there and nobody's going to be down there anyway. I'm giving you myself for an example because I feel that might make you a little more comfortable and because it's true. To just be transparent and honest, I have to say, you got to do this because you're pressing in in prayer. And you know what's amazing <laughs> is that then I get here and somewhere about 1230 or so, I'm, um, oh, what a privilege. Why aren't we doing this every day? But do you know I forget it two days later? Oh, it's almost noon. I got to do this again. And then I get here. Oh, this is good. This is what you're drawn us to. Things are going to be changing because the flesh and the spirit are constantly like this. But when we start to have those Holy Ghost breakthroughs in prayer that Brother Hagin talks about when he said when he started out doing the Ephesians prayers and he was trying to do an hour, he said, literally, he told us this all the time in class. He said, literally, every five minutes I go, has it been an hour? Oh, it's only been five minutes. Has it been an hour? Oh, it's only been 10 minutes. Has it been an hour yet? But he said, the day came. He stepped over in the Holy Ghost. And, and, and when he kind of came to himself, oh, I wonder if it's been an hour yet. And it was eight hours. He had to discipline himself at first. But then the spirit took over the flesh. And it became a want to thing. A want to thing. That's where we're going. To want to do thy will and thy bidding, O Lord. Would you stand with me?